Hey guys, Dr. Cadell here, and this is determining the molar mass of an unknown carbonate using the ideal gas law. Ideal gas law for sure. Short. All right, so the idea is this. First of all, what's an unknown carbonate? Well, carbonate means that it's an ionic compound, and the anion is carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Um, what's unknown about it is, well, the molar mass, because different cations give it different molar masses. A um, couple of possibilities. It either is going to look something like this up here, where this X stands for whatever the cation is. If the cation has a plus one charge, there will be two of them to balance the negative two charge on the carbonate, and it'll be two of those for one carbonate. On the other hand, if the cation has a positive two charge, there will only be one of those because there's a negative two charge on the carbonate, balanced by the positive two on the cation. Um, those are the only possibilities you have. So, your goal is to determine, to figure out what the molar mass of your unknown is. Now remember, molar mass is grams over moles, right? So because it's your unknown that you want the molar mass of, you want to know how many grams of your unknown you have and how many moles of your unknown you have. The, um, the grams is easy. We're going to weigh it, and you have that right away. It's The rest of this whole experiment is figuring out how many moles of your unknown carbonate you weighed out. Now, Here's how you're going to do it. And here's where the ideal gas law comes into play. If you look at both of these equations here, you see that one of the products in both cases is carbon dioxide gas. And if you'll notice from the stoichiometry, the mole ratio, there's one mole of carbon dioxide produced for every one mole of your unknown, whichever form you have. Which means that if we can somehow figure out how many moles of carbon dioxide are given off, produced, that's the same as the moles of our unknown, which is the bottom part of this equation. And we'll have it. That, so that's how we're going to do it. And I'm going to show you guys the apparatus where you get, the, get that information from in just a minute. But if you come down here and look at the ideal gas law, this is going to apply to the carbon dioxide gas that's given off. PV equals NRT, where P is the pressure of the carbon dioxide gas. V is the volume of the carbon dioxide gas given off. R's good old gas constant, 0 0.08206 liters atmospheres per Kelvin mole. And T is the temperature of the carbon dioxide gas in Kelvin. There's one little twist on this that we have to take into account. Um, when you guys see the apparatus, you'll see that where the carbon dioxide gas is collected, it's going to be on top of some water. And it ends up that whenever you have a gas on top of water, water also contribute some to the pressure inside of that container. Some of those water molecules will evaporate and they'll be mixed in with the carbon dioxide gas. And we want just the pressure for the ideal gas law of just the carbon dioxide gas. But that's, that's pretty easy to get because if we look over here at this equation, okay, it ends up that um, the pressure of just the carbon dioxide gas will be equal to the atmospheric pressure. That's what this is. And we're, we can measure that. The, the pressure that this whole um, setup is going to be under will be the atmospheric pressure because it's open to the atmosphere, minus the pressure of the water. Um, and I'm going to show you how to get this number. We're going to measure this number, and that's how we get this. Once we have the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of the gas, we can rearrange the ideal gas law and solve for N. N is how many moles of gas there is, and that's what we want. That'll give us the moles of carbon dioxide gas that are produced, which gives us the moles of our unknown, which is a denominator, and because we measured the mass, we have everything we need, and we have the molar mass for our unknown. So why don't we go over there and get started on the experiment? Hey guys, so this is how to read the vapor pressure of water at the temperature of your experiment from this table that is in the, um, the laboratory procedure. So you're going to do this three times, um, once for the temperature you got for A2, once for the temperature at B2, and once at C2. All you do to get the vapor pressure of water at that temperature is um, find that temperature to the ones place in the left hand column. Let's say your temperature was 37.3 degrees Celsius. You find the 37 in the left hand column, see in purple right there, and then you find the tenths place in the top row, 0.3, where, the, where that column and that row intersect, 
that number right there, so 47.7 is what it would be for 37.3 degrees Celsius. That 47.7 is the vapor pressure of water at that temperature in millimeters of mercury. And that's all there is to it. All right, guys, so um, this is the setup for the, the gas law experiment. What you're gonna need is you're gonna need your 600 milliliter beaker, a quart-sized mason jar with the lid, now these lids are paired to the specific mason jar, so make sure you get the one that has the same number on it, like this has number one, and this has number one. A pint-sized mason jar, these aren't numbered, they don't matter, has a lid, has one piece of glass tubing in it. You're going to need two pieces of rubber tubing, doesn't matter what size they are, or what length, rather, they are. You're going to need one plastic cuvette, pipette bulb, what those are, a short piece of glass tubing, a pinch clamp, two gaskets, as well as a digital thermometer, and your 150 milliliter beaker from your locker. That should get you ready to go. You're also going to have to use a 500 mil graduated cylinder, but as Matt says here, please share. This is not just for you. So the first thing we're gonna to have to do is because we need to know how many grams of our unknown we have, that's the top part of the molar mass equation, we're gonna weigh out our unknown. You're gonna take the cuvette, your unknown. As always, when you have an unknown, you have an unknown number. Make sure you take that off and tape that in your data table where it says unknown number. Okay. Then we're gonna take the cuvette, pop it into the balance. Because we don't care about how much the cuvette weighs, we're gonna tear out the balance. And because we never pour anything directly onto the balance, we're going to take the cuvette out, it's teared, add some. We want about 1.5 grams of our unknown. It doesn't have to be exactly 1.5, just as long as you're in the neighborhood. Now, we don't want to go too much over, and I'll show you why when we get this whole thing set up. And there we go. So that, that number is going to be different for everybody, but that's going to be your A1. And you're, we're going to repeat this, you're going to repeat this process three times. So you're going to have the A's, the B's, and the C's. So we have our unknown. It's in the cuvette. We're going to take it and we're going to put it into the pint-sized mason jar, making sure we don't spill any of our unknown. Next, we're going to take our quart-sized mason jar and fill it all the way to the very top with just regular old tap water. We want to get as much water in here as we can, guys. I'll show you why in a minute, too. So see how it's overflowing? That's pretty much what you want. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna connect our rubber tubing. Um, and the way we're gonna connect it, here's one place where you can go wrong if you don't get it set up correctly. So if you can see, and this is the lid for the quart size mason jar, it has two pieces of glass tubing in it. One that does not go down as far as the other. We wanna connect the one that does not go down as far to this other lid. I think about it as short to short. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a piece of rubber tubing and it really helps if you stick the ends into some water. It goes on so much more easily. We're going to pop this onto the short piece of glass tubing right here just like that. We went on pretty good because there's a lot of pressure that ends up building up in here and we don't want it popping off. And the other goes here. Now at this point, we want to make sure we have gaskets in here. Those two gaskets that we have, um, we, if we don't have these inside of the lids, this whole thing is going to leak, which is disastrous for this experiment. Um, also, you want to make sure, make sure that you don't have one in there already, because if you put two gaskets in, it leaks also. So one in each, and we're good. Now I'm going to put the... Um, other piece of rubber tubing is going to go from the long piece in this lid right here, just like this. And that short piece of glass tubing that we had, this goes on the other end. And this goes into your 600 milliliter beaker. So real quickly, this is how, this is how the tubing should look right here. You see how 
this short piece is connected to this short piece, short piece right here, and this long as it goes over here. So now we're going to put the lid on the quart size mason jar. It doesn't have to be on too tight yet. In a minute it will. And now <clears throat> I'm going to ask Matt, who runs a stock room, to come on over and give me a hand. What Matt's going to do, um, this is a two person process. So he's going to take this pipette bowl, put it on here, press on it. When he does, what's going to happen, this is kind of how this setup works, guys. He's going to apply pressure to the water that's inside of this container right here. Now that water, it's going to go where there's less pressure pushing back. And the only place that is in this setup is the bottom of that long piece of glass tubing. So then the water is going to want to go up that and out here. Our goal in doing this is to get water in this whole part of the setup right here. And I'll tell you why in just a minute. So if Matt's ready, as he does that, once water is coming out of this into the 600 milliliter beaker, milliliter beaker I'm going to clamp it off right above where that piece of glass tubing is. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Notice how he pulled that pipette bulb off without releasing it, because if he did, he would try to suck the water back up. And so now, thank you, Matt, mm. what we have is water filling this long piece of glass tube and this um, tubing and this rubber piece of tubing. What we're going to do now is take that water, put it back into the middle container. Now we're going to put this lid on and this has to be tight guys. Um, if it's not tight, we can get a leak and like I said, leaks are disastrous for this experiment. And disastrous in terms that your numbers don't work. Now we have our unknown over here, the hydrochloric acid that's going to react with it. We're going to take and we're going to add a little bit more than 10 mils. I'm not going to measure this out carefully. We don't, we don't need to. It's a waste of time. Um, I'm going to use a 10 mil grad cylinder. This is six more hydrochloric acid. And I'm going to add a little bit over 10 mils. So if you can see, I, I put more than 10 mils, good enough. And now what I'm going to do, we have to be a little bit careful here, guys. We want to make sure this acid does not touch the unknown. If it does, it starts reacting right away. So I'm going to pour it in. There we go. Let's set up, and we're real careful not to spill that. Now we're going to take this lid, put it on the pint-sized mason jar. Pretty tight. We need this one tight, too. Now we're ready to go. But before we um, um, run, run this, uh, this reaction, let me just make sure you guys understand how this whole setup works. Once I start shaking this, the unknown will spill, the carbonate will spill, it'll hit the hydrochloric acid and starts reacting right away. That carbon dioxide gas that's given off, it's going to come up through here and do just like Matt did with a pipette bulb. It's going to exert pressure on the water in this middle container. And that water is going to go where there's less pressure pushing back because I'm going to take this off in a minute. Um, the water is going to come out here. Now remember, the th three numbers, the three measurements we need for this experiment are the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of the gas. Three things, P, V, and T. The volume, okay, we're going to assume, and it's a very good assumption, that the volume of water that gets pushed over is equal to the volume of gas that's produced during the reaction. It'd be really hard to measure the volume of gas, but we can measure this water real easily. That's what our 500 mil graduated cylinder is for. That's also why we want to be we wanted to be careful not to add too much of our unknown, you know, not much more than 1.5 grams, because if we have too much, we're going to make too much carbon dioxide gas and we'll run out of water, and then the volume wouldn't be accurate. Um, that's also why we want this to be full to begin with. Um, <clears throat> we're going to get the temperature by measuring the temperature in here right after the reaction, and to get the pressure, we're going to go out in the hallway, read the atmospheric pressure from the barometer, and then we can subtract the vapor pressure of water to get our pressure of carbon dioxide. So it looks like we're ready to go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this pinch clamp off first. And it's important that I hold this because if I don't, it sometimes sprays everywhere. Shake this up.
And now the water stopped coming out, the reaction has stopped, reaction is finished. What I do now is immediately take the pinch clamp and put it back on. That way for the next run, I don't have to push water through here again. Immediately I want to measure the temperature in here because it's going to change. And so I'm going to not use the digital thermometer, like I originally said, because this is acid, it will deteriorate the metal. I'm going to use a glass thermometer, read this to one place past the decimal. I'm going to record that. That's going to be my A2. And then for the second trial, B2, third trial, C2. Once I get that, good to go. We can measure the volume of the water right now. So I'm going to take my graduated cylinder, pour the water into there. Remember, we're assuming that the volume of this water is the same as the volume of the gas that pushed it over, and it is. Um, when we read these graduated cylinders, most of them have two scales. Uh, one starts at zero at the top, goes down to 500 at the bottom. We do not want to use that. The other one starts with zero at the bottom, goes up to 500. That's the one we're using. With this graduated cylinder, the closest marks are five milliliters apart which means we can only record this to the ones place. So I'm going to read that volume, making sure it's flat, read the bottom of the meniscus to the ones place, and that's going to be my A4. The last thing we need is the atmospheric pressure, so we're going to go out in the hallway and read the atmospheric pressure from the barometer. All right, so um, when we're reading the atmospheric pressure from this barometer right here, um, first thing to notice is that there are two scales. The outer scale is in millibars. The inner scale is in inches of mercury. We will use inches of mercury, the inner scale. The next thing to notice is that the, the needle that points to the atmospheric pressure, um, the end we read is the, the narrow end, the top end right here. Then the next thing is that if you look at the closest marks um, on the inches of mercury scale, they're 0 0.02 inches of mercury apart, which means that the best we can do when we read this is measure this pressure to the hundredths place, um, to pass the decimal. And so, for example, if the needle is on the third mark past the 30, we would say this is um, 30.06 inches of mercury. So now that we have um, all of the data that we need, the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of the gas, um, we're ready for the next trial, all the Bs, and then the third trial, the Cs, we're done. That's all there is to it.